coming up on At Issue. I think that more people need to realize that this is a sign of heritage and not hate. Something that represents nothing but dark and evil times for our African American and minorities for over years and years. State flag fights. Groups in favor of preserving the flag show their support at the Capitol. It's the toughest one I've ever gone through, I promise you. Election challenges. The House and Senate settle disputes over contested races. And one lawmaker wants to publicly identify DUI drivers with a special license tag. That issue starts right now. Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Wilson Stribling. Welcome to another season of At Issue, where we discuss and debate the critical issues facing the state of Mississippi and how those issues impact you. And we want you to share your opinions and comments with us. Just go to facebook.com slash MPB online news. On Twitter, our handle is at issue MPB. Also visit our webpage, mpbonline.org. The big story, budget cuts. Governor Phil Bryant is ordering cuts for state agencies because state tax collections are falling tens of millions of dollars short. Governor Bryant is directing state agencies to cut budgets by one and a half percent across the board for a savings of nearly 40 million state dollars. He is also ordering the transfer of 35 million dollars from the state's rainy day fund. MAEP, the Mississippi Adequate Education Program, will not be cut. The governor says he hopes these cost-cutting measures will be enough to get through the 2016 fiscal year, but he says more cuts could be necessary later. The governor sent a letter about his orders to Kevin Upchurch, the executive director of the Department of Finance and Administration. In it, he says, quote, I feel it is imperative that we take action based on the best possible information available. If we postpone spending reductions until later, then the state agencies must make relatively larger cuts and will have less flexibility and time to handle the necessary reductions. Lieutenant Governor Tate Reeves and House Speaker Philip Gunn released this joint statement on the state agency cuts. Quote, while reducing agency budgets mid-year is not an easy decision, we appreciate Governor Bryant's actions because as Republicans, we all agree that we are not going to spend money that we do not have. We plan to lead by example and cut the legislature's budget by the same amount as the across-the-board cuts announced for agencies. Well, the 2016 legislative session is just three weeks old, and we've already hit the first hot-button issue, the state flag, whether it should be changed or stay the same. Hundreds of supporters who want Mississippi to keep the flag the way it is met at the state capitol this week. Several pro-flag pro groups, including the Mississippi Division of the Sons of Confederate Veterans and the newly formed Dixie Alliance, sponsored the rally. The Dixie Alliance was formed after the flag controversy erupted again last year. Some see the Confederate battle emblem on the flag, a symbol of hate, while others see it as a symbol of heritage. I believe this is something that the Mississippi people have had for over 100 years, and uh, this, this flag has been supported by the people for all this time, and it shouldn't be taken down because of an agenda that was started after uh, a tragedy that happened in South Carolina. It's, this is something the people have always had and always been behind, and you, sh and you shouldn't try to, try to say that there's hate in a flag or a piece of material when, when we know that that's not true. Well, it's time for us to have a state flag that represents all of the citizens, um, and we need a symbol that our youth can look upon and see unity and not oppression. The flag, yes, it is part of our um, history here in Mississippi, but that part of history is such a dark history that's embedded in white supremacy and hatred, and it's just time for us to have a state flag that represents our state motto, and that's the hospitality state. And unfortunately, the flag does not represent that. A group protesting the state flag called the Flag for All Coalition held a demonstration of their own that day. There are currently five ballot initiatives on the state flag. Four are in favor of the current state flag. One is opposed to it. Well, the first orders of business for both the House and the Senate were to settle two election disputes. Over in the Senate, incumbent Republican Melanie Sojourner challenged her loss to former Democratic Senator Bob Deering in the District 37 race, a race she lost by just 64 votes last November. That district covers Adams, Amit, Franklin, and Pike counties. Sojourner's attorney alleged the election was not conducted properly 
and election laws were violated. A special Senate committee heard testimony from witnesses involved in the election and affirmed Deering's victory, thus rejecting Sojourner's challenge. The Senate voted 47 to 3 to allow Deering to be seated. I'm certainly glad it's over. Uh, it's been a long time since November 3rd election when I won by 64 votes and uh, never thought we'd end up in a challenge like this, but uh, I'm glad this challenge is over and the senators voted in our favor. In the House, a special committee heard testimony on the election challenge brought by Republican Mark Tullis against Democratic incumbent Bo Eaton in District 79. The two candidates were tied after the votes were tallied, so they had to draw straws to determine a winner. Eaton won the tiebreaker, but Tullis challenged the tie, and the Republican-led House voted in his favor, thus giving him the seat. I'm glad it's over for both sides. I'm glad it's over for uh, Mr. Eaton and his family and me and my family. It's uh, Mr. Eaton has served Smith County and, and uh, District 79 for, as you heard, 21 years. And uh, I'm, sure I, I'm sure I share the same sentiment as, as the citizens of that district that we appreciate what he's done and the work that he has done and the manner in which he's done it. He's been a gentleman throughout his career. And uh, I just wish the best for him. The House also voted unanimously to toss out a Democratic primary challenge by Tasha Dillon to unseat Democrat David Myers in District 98. Dillon claimed they were voting irregularities during the August 4th primary. Dillon will continue to push for relief in the courts by asking a judge to unseat Myers. The 98th covers Pike and Walthall counties. Well, improving state election laws and moving up Mississippi's presidential primary. That's what Secretary of State Delbert Hoseman is proposing to lawmakers. During a press conference this week, Hoseman announced he plans to rewrite the state's election laws. His plan calls for making it easier for voters to cast their ballots, pushing for tougher penalties for those who commit election crimes, and moving the presidential primary to the first Tuesday in March, also known as Super Tuesday, and the SEC primary, so we'd have more pull in selecting a presidential nominee. If you would like more details on Hoseman's election law overhaul plan, just go to our website, mpbonline.org. Job creation, education, and gun rights were highlighted by Governor Bryant during his second and final inaugural address. That was seen statewide live here on MPB. The inauguration ceremony took place on the south steps of the Capitol on January 12th. The crowd enjoyed a sunny and cool day in contrast to Governor Bryant's first inauguration when the outdoor ceremony got rained out and had to be moved inside the Capitol. The theme of this year's inauguration, Imagine Mississippi. Bryant defeated Democrat Robert Gray in the November election. Well, now let's get straight to the point with our two political analysts. Austin Barber is a Republican national strategist. He is the founding partner of the Clearwater Group. Brandon Jones is a Democrat. He's an attorney at the Beria Jones Law Firm and a former House member. Gentlemen, good to have you back this year, and uh, we look forward to lots of good discussions here on that issue. Let's start with what we started with at the top of this program, uh, budget cuts. This is something that Governor Bryant has not had to do up until this point. Yeah, and thanks for having us back for year two. Look forward to having some meaningful conversations with Brandon throughout this year. Yes. Uh, but no, listen, budget cuts. I think what's important to, to remember here um, is that you see the Republican governor uh, supported by the Republican Speaker of the House and Lieutenant Governor who are saying, listen, we're not going to spend more money than we have. We're going to follow our, our conservative principles of governing. And I think the governor's doing the right thing. Um, there's a rainy day fund that's been fully funded for the past four years by this legislature and, and supported by the governor. And there's, you know, three or four hundred million dollars that's sitting there. I think there actually be three hundred and seventy five million dollars left after the governor um, uh, transfers over thirty five million dollars or so forth to help. Um, with the with the revenue issues, Brendan, did it surprise you that the uh, that the governor is tapping into the rainy day fund for this purpose? Just a bit, as, as lieutenant governor, and then in his first term as governor, he spent a lot of time talking about why we couldn't access the rainy day fund. Interesting that hours after Republicans achieve a supermajority, we're reaching into it. But we'll see. I mean, it's a little early to be too critical. We need to see exactly 
precisely where these cuts are going. And of course, the budgeting process by and large does rest on the legislature and that'll take place later in the session. Yeah, and, and I think the, the big takeaway here is to remember um, that just because we have revenue estimates that, that are lower than obviously the numbers that they predicted, we still ha we're still taking in more money than we did you know, 12 months before. And there's no reason for Republicans or leadership in the House or the Senate to try to say, well, I don't know if we can go, um, go do tax reductions. We still need to try to find a way uh, to reduce income taxes for small businesses and individuals in Mississippi. And I'm, I'm almost positive that the House and the Senate and um, Tate Reeves and Philip Gunn will fight for that. Just to jump in real briefly, I, I do think it's a kind of peculiar juxtaposition to start out the legislative session talking about this is a rainy day. Mm -hmm. This is so rainy that it justifies going into our, uh, you know, ulterior fund. And then to segue into the conversation on tax cuts, I, I think that any economist would say that if you're not meeting your revenue estimates, if you're not able to fund your agencies at the level that is expected, this probably isn't a time to just look for a political ploy to satisfy, you know, it's some of the loudest voice. It's not a political ploy. It's trying to bring better government to the state of Mississippi. I mean, listen, we're talking about less than 10% of what's in the rainy day fund right now. And um, th these legislators, the governor, the lieutenant governor, speaker of the house, were elected to go do things like cut taxes, give taxpayers a tax raise, a pay raise, excuse me. And I know we don't want to get mired down in budget cuts and put everybody to sleep at home, but I think this is very important that we don't forget about cutting taxes this year. Let's move on. Let's talk. You mentioned, Brandon, the supermajority, uh, which came out of an election challenge uh, over on the House side. We have a supermajority now. Were there any surprises uh, in the outcomes of any of these uh, election challenges for you, Austin? Um, I don't think so, particularly not in the Senate. I mean, we saw a 49 to 3 vote, I think is what you said, or 48 to 3. Sojourner, against uh, Sojourner. Yeah. yeah, and I had I just didn't pay close attention to what happened in the House. But you know, Mark Baker is a lawyer. He's well respected in the House. He's well respected in the legal community. Um, I know that he felt like there were some real issues, procedural issues with particular affidavit ballots that were counted on the night of the election and notification of both campaigns. Brandon and I have done a bunch of campaigns and election challenges. I mean, there there are specific protocols and procedures that have to be followed, including if you're going to open up affidavit ballots, you got to let both campaigns know. I think that was the big issue of why they end up saying there's five or six votes we can't count, which means Tullis is the winner. We've got a supermajority now in the House, uh, and we've got a Republican governor and a Republican lieutenant governor. Overall, Brandon, what does that mean for Democrats this year? Well, if you don't mind, just on the issue of the challenge itself, I mean, I've been involved in close races. I've tried cases that involved election challenges. I have never seen an election set aside on such flimsy evidence. And we had the Mississippi Secretary of State, a Republican, an outspoken Republican, who was there to bless each step of this process, including what was happening at the local level, and who said as late as yesterday, members of his office said, those votes should have counted. So this was not a legal event, this was a political event. And I know Bo well, served with Bo, um, he did serve with distinction. I had, happened to have a conversation with Bo at a Southern Miss game uh, shortly after the election, and uh, I told him, I said, look, hold out confidence that they won't overstep. That all the rules were followed, this stuff was checked all along the way, let's give the new leadership team a chance to do something that's not, you know, kind of political uh, bullying and they whiffed on it. And I will say, to juxtapose that with what happened in the Senate, it's chess versus checkers. Mm -hmm. I thought that Lieutenant Governor Reeves allowed a process to take hold that resembled what you would see in a legal proceeding involving an election challenge. And what happened in the House was kangaroo court. Was it all political? I don't think so. I mean, I, again, you and I both know Mark Baker. Mark Baker is not going to go forward with a political only process. Um, he and the committee that were appointed by the speaker, I think they followed the procedures that they felt like were right, and made the decision and put it in front of the House and the House voted, you know, with probably a 20 vote margin or so forth uh, to move this way. But. Uh, that, that's, that's my opinion, and we obviously will have to agree to disagree on We this obviously one. know two different Mark Bakers. <laughs> well, the one I know is a pretty good guy. Either way, that vote did create the supermajority uh, sure in the House. What does that mean for the next for the next few years? I think it's great. I mean, if you if you're um, no matter if you're a Republican or independent or Democrat, and you believe in smaller government, if you believe in lower taxes uh, and sort of this this governing with the conservative principle, I think that is a great step to see.
And what does it mean for Democrats, the supermajority? Well, for us, we got our clocks cleaned. I mean, the voters spoke overwhelmingly in favor of the Republican plan. I told Austin during the course of the election that if this theory of just simply coming out with a statement that says vote Republican mm -hmm. wins, then there really was no political option for Democrats. And so that's what won. And it didn't just win by slight margins. It was pretty pretty serious margins across the board. And so, you know, I, I will say it is notable that Mississippi continues to have the only statewide elected Democrat in Jim Hood who yeah. won really, you know, convincingly. And then Democrats did take a majority on the Public Service Commission. But when you look at the legislature, it was a pretty stark uh, November. Yeah, and there were some who thought Hood would lose. I mean, Hood faced his probably mm -hmm. toughest Republican challenger in many years, and I don't remember what the, the total vote was. I think he probably got more than 55% of the vote, maybe 56, 57, um, but you're right. Let's talk about uh, this issue that uh, that Secretary of State Delbert Hoseman uh, proposed. He's, he's proposed some ideas for what he calls completely reforming the election laws uh, in Mississippi. Uh, the various things he proposed, we talked about them a moment ago. What do you think about what he's proposed? I, I, you know, I have been involved in presidential campaigns uh, in the past. I'm currently involved as a senior advisor to Governor Bush's campaign. Uh, March 1st, you've got 12 or 13 states that will be voting, SEC primary, Super Tuesday, whatever you want to call it. Of course, Mississippi is a week later on March the 8th. And I tend to disagree with Secretary of State Hoseman on this, full respect. I um, think he's doing a great job, but I just disagree. I think Mississippi will get more attention as being one of two or three or four states that vote March the 8th than it being one of 13 or 14 that vote March the 1st, whether it was this year or next year. I just think we'll get more attention, more visits from presidential candidates, more potential advertising dollars that come into our, our TV stations and radio stations if we're one of a smaller number versus a larger number. And there there will be the argument, well, we you know, we may not be a part of the decision if we're the eighth versus the first. I don't think one week is gonna matter, particularly in a primary season that is as topsy-turvy as 2016 has been. What do you think about this SEC primary joining in with it? Yeah, yeah, well, look, let's be honest. Mississippi has never swung a presidential election and the likelihood of that happening is not great. But I will agree with Austin. I was about to say, I'll remember, remember, remember right 76. now. He'll, he'll I'll, break it I'll and tell 76. I, I will agree that um, it, we would tend to get lost in the shuffle against sister states that have more votes in play. Texas, um, Tennessee, Georgia. Yeah, that's right. But I, I think, I will say this. Now, there's a subtext here to this bill that has to do with earlier voting, um, things that, you know, Democrats have advocated for for some time. I do think we should be looking for ways that preserve the integrity of the vote, but also do encourage more people to participate. We haven't mentioned this, but last November, that was a bad turnout. I mean, that was that was a weak, anemic turnout. Yeah, but you we, know, that's driven by the top of the ticket. And the top of the ticket, we just didn't have a competitive Democrat, and you had a governor who was as popular as we talked about before the, his inauguration as any governor in a long time. So I, I understand what you're saying. You, you want more people to have more opportunities to vote. I want to be cautious with it. I think voter ID gives me confidence that we're going to have uh, um, a process that's going to be protected. And I think voter ID probably gives uh, more Republicans a little more ease with early voting, but I don't know that there's enough there to pass it or not. I, I don't I hadn't well, hold it yet. We honored Mr. Vernon Damer Sr. earlier this uh, week, and one of his favorite things to say was, if you don't vote, you don't count. That's right. And there are a lot of Mississippians who don't count right now, and they're not showing up to the polls. So Absolutely. anything we can do to encourage that would be good. I agree. Well, we'll let that be the, the last words here. Brandon Jones, Austin Barber, thank, thank you, you both, and we'll look forward to having you back here next week. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, one lawmaker wants to identify DUI drivers when they get back behind the wheel and shame those drivers in the process. Representative Gary Chisholm has introduced a bill that calls for second offense DUI drivers to be issued a bright colored license plate for their vehicle. Some have likened it to a scarlet letter. Chisholm says the bill mirrors a similar law in Ohio. We spoke with him and Representative Robert Johnson about it. When somebody sees this bright yellow with red writing tag, they're going to first say, what in the world? That? And they're going to find out. Nobody will want that tag. And what's even worse is we're going to make you pay for that tag. And it's going to have to be on the car that you drive. I mean, I think we should be as tough on people with DUIs as, as possible, but if people have uh, paid their penalty and they've served, uh, I, don't, I don't think that penalty 
keeps people from drinking. I think we need to work on rehabilitation services. We need to work on the mental illness associated with it. But just putting a label on people, making it, you know, shaming them, I don't, I don't think that helps. We will continue to monitor the progress of the so-called scarlet letter bill during the session. Well, the list of candidates is locked for Mississippi's congressional primaries on March 8th. That's when voters will choose party nominees for the U.S. House of Representatives in Washington. In the 1st District, incumbent Trent Kelly will go up against Paul Cleaver in the Republican primary. Jacob Aaron Owens is the only Democrat, so he'll be unopposed on primary day. In the 2nd District, Democrat in Democratic incumbent Benny Thompson has no challengers in the primary. On the Republican side, John Bowie is running, although he lives outside the district. In the 3rd District. Republican incumbent Greg Harper will face Jim Giles in the primary. Nathan Stewart and Dennis Quinn will duke it out on the Democratic side. And in the 4th District, there's no primary opposition for Republican incumbent Stephen Palazzo or Democrat Mark Day Gladney. State lawmakers remembered the courage and character of Vernon Daber at the Capitol 50 years after the civil rights leader was killed during an attack by the KKK on his family home north of Hattiesburg. A special ceremony was held at the old Capitol building. Senator John Horn says the tribute was long overdue, but better late than never. Daber owned a commercial farm, sawmill, and grocery store, and he was involved in helping blacks register to vote. The Klan torched his home on January 10, 1966. Damer's family, including his widow, Ellie, attended that ceremony. KKK leader Sam Bowers was convicted and given a life sentence for murder and arson. In 1998, he died in prison in 2006. We are going to turn now to our reporter's notebook. We welcome MPB's Paul Boger to talk with us about what's happening at the Capitol in the legislature and what's to come. Paul, good to have you back with us this year. It's good to be back. You're well connected over at the Capitol. You're there every day. Let's talk about some of these issues we've been discussing uh, okay. on this program. First of all, budget cuts. Budget cuts were a little bit of a surprise for everybody yesterday. Mm -hmm. They came late in the afternoon. Uh, I was part of a meeting that we got a little bit of background information. And the budget cuts, like was said, are about 1.5% for just about 84 uh, state agencies and programs, special funds, stuff like that. However, there are some key exemptions. You mentioned MAEP, which is the way schools get their funding. That's being exempt. Uh, children and Family Services, that's being exempt, because, especially because of the Olivia Y case. Um, DPS, Department of Public Safety, Veterans Affairs, those things are being left alone. So. Oh, in, uh, in, in the light of the budget cuts, it, it, we, we talked a moment ago about tax cuts. Is there already some buzz at the Capitol about bills to cut taxes or, or, or any moves to cut taxes? That was pretty much the first thing out of, out of everybody's mouth the first day. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, speaking to the uh, Senate's press forum, said they're going to try again this year to, to cut the uh, personal income tax, the, uh, the, the, the lower two portions of that, the franchise tax, and the, the small business owner tax. Uh, let's go back to MAEP. Uh, there's some talk at the Capitol about maybe not, not just looking at how, whether to fully fund MAEP, mm -hmm. although we'll probably get to that, but actually looking at MAEP itself. Right. This kind of came from last year. It, it got put on hold with the 42 debate. Now it's being brought back up. One of the things they're looking at is the way MAEP actually works. It's a huge formula. It's very complicated. But essentially, to figure out how much the state spends per pupil, they take the standard deviation of C school districts, how much they spend. Mm -hmm. It's a very complicated process, <laughs> but they use C school districts. That's the important part. Now they're looking to do use A and B school districts, or A or B, some variation of that. That's the big push this year. A and B being the schools that perform better right. than the others. And, and the theory is that those school districts tend to do a little bit better. They also tend to spend a little bit less money. Mm -hmm. So if you're you, spending less money, as an A and B school district, you're likely going to spend less money on MAEP. So we could have a lot of discussion about, like we said, not only fully funding MAEP, but exactly what that means and is it the, is it the right formula as, as it currently stands. There's also a push, MAEP looks at average daily attendance. That's a snapshot of how many kids are in a particular school on any given day. That's the formula that the state uses to decide how many students are in the state. 
There's also a big push, and I think you'll see this one actually pass, to go with ADM. There's been a lot of talk with that. The ADM is average daily membership. Essentially, it's enrollment numbers versus attendance numbers. Mm -hmm. So some tweaks to the formula that could affect uh, the, the way this is figured out each year. All right, infrastructure. There's a lot of talk about bridges and highways and, and, and that we're in bad shape. That's on the national level and, of course, on the, on the state level. Uh, do you think we'll see some legislation this year having to do with that? I, you know, speaking personally, as somebody who drives a car, I hope so. Uh, no, I think you're going to see some push. You know, it all comes back down to these budget cuts. You know, it, it throws a very big wrench in the system. So there's a big push by business leaders, uh, the Mississippi Economic Council, especially the state chamber, to do these infrastructure repairs to increase funding for roads and bridges. I think a lot of, there's a lot of support for it. Is there money for it? I don't know. Uh, there have been uh, movements before to maybe do something with the gasoline tax and how we tax drivers who fill up at the tank. Perhaps with gas prices as low as they are, could that discussion be revived? You know, that gets brought up a lot. The gas tax is essentially, if I'm not mistaken, the one thing that actually funds the Department of Transportation, almost exclusively. Now, is that money going to be there? Again, with the tax cuts, the gas tax, I don't think there's a, any kind of will to increase any kind of tax here in the state. You expect any surprises out of the uh, state of the state address from the governor here coming up next week? You know, the governor's message of the last few months since the election has been pretty consistent and it's been expect more of the same. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to hear, we're going to hear a lot about these tax cuts. You're going to hear a lot about revenues. You're going to hear a lot about economic development. What you're not going to hear is the words increase taxes, I think. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's probably pretty standard. We'll find out for sure because uh, the State of the State Address is coming up on Tuesday. You can watch it live here on MPB. It will be at 5 o'clock p.m. on Tuesday, January 26th. You can join us then. Paul, thank you for joining us on the program today. We're out of time. We invite you to join us again next Friday night on MPB for another edition of At Issue.